We are now armed with an ensemble partition function that we derived from first principles for a monatomic ideal gas. Are you excited? I I'm pretty excited about that. I think that's a fascinating thing. And so uh, let's take that partition function and let's actually start computing macroscopic properties from it because that's going to be a, a real accomplishment to have taken knowledge of microscopic behavior and energy levels and predict macroscopic properties. Let's dive in. So I'll just recall the result at the end of the last lecture, namely that the ensemble partition function is the product of a translational partition function, shown here, depends on volume and temperature, and an electronic partition function, shown here, that depends on temperature. And if you don't see temperature, remember it's hiding in beta. Beta is 1 over kT. Raised to the nth power, divide by n factorial. Well, let's use that in order to predict the internal energy of our monatomic ideal gas. And I'll remind you that the internal energy is kT squared times the partial derivative with respect to t of the log of the partition function. And by virtue of the ensemble partition function being for a, a gas composed of indistinguishable, non-interacting molecules or atoms, that allows us to write it as this function that depends on the atomic partition function. So I'll just substitute that in. I have it to the nth power. So when I take a logarithm, I'm going to get an n out front. So I take the partial derivative of the log of little q with respect to temperature. And now I uh, plug in for little q the translational partition function times the electronic partition function because that's what the atomic partition function is. It's the product of these two when it's a monatomic gas. So now let's actually substitute in the correct expressions. So here I've put in for Q trans, I have put in the correct partition function for translation. And for Q electronic, I've put in the correct partition function for Q electronic. And let's just do the partial derivative. So it's partial partial t of the log of all this stuff. Well, this is something to a power. A log to a power is like the power times the log. So there's a three halves. Let's keep that three halves around for a moment. And then I take a log of a product, and actually it's a ratio, so I'll get logs of things plus things, minus things in the denominator. In the end, all I'll end up with is partial partial t log of t. So that'll give me 1 over t. That's multiplied times t squared. So here's my three halves. n comes over to n. k comes over to k. The t squared over t is t, and that's it. I'm all done with everything having to do with the translational partition function. All right, just three halves n k t, and indeed, we derived that previously. So that's the translational part. That's the electronic part. That's the result of taking the derivative properly for the translational part. And now comes the question, what happens when we take the derivative with respect to the electronic portion of the partition function? So I'm going to let you work on that one, actually, and give it a try, and then we'll come back. All right. Hopefully you throttled that partial derivative into submission, and you discovered that the missing term is n times the degeneracy of the first excited state times the energy relative to the ground state for that state, e to the minus beta times that energy again. And so, of course, G1 does not depend on temperature. That's just the degeneracy of the ground state. The second term is the first term that does have a temperature dependence because beta appears here. But you've already derived that, so I don't have to tell you. And again, I'll emphasize that the electronic contribution to the internal energy is typically going to be quite small. And as a result, the internal energy is 3 halves nkt it's dominated by the translational contribution because the fraction of molecules in excited electronic states is usually extremely small at what I'll call low temperatures or normal temperatures, anything much less than thousands of degrees. And actually, just to you know, explore that and put some numbers on it. So of course, I say this is the way it is, but let's really look at the numbers for a moment. 
So here is the partition, sorry, the internal energy that we derived, and I'm telling you it's really small. Let's look at a couple different atoms. Okay, so let's consider first the lithium atom, which remember has a first excited state, 14,900 and let's round to four, we don't have to carry around all those significant digits, uh, wave numbers above the ground state, and it has a degeneracy of two. And then there's the fluorine atom, which has a first excited state, a mere 404 wave numbers above the ground state, also with a degeneracy of two. So if I ask about the contributions to the total internal energy, each of them has a three halves NKT that contributes. And actually, let's pick a particular T and also a particular number of uh, atoms so that we can have a, a true value. So let's take Avogadro's number. That's always a nice one. We'll have one mole of atoms. And we'll work at room temperature, 298.15 Kelvin. And then let's uh, express our energy in kilojoules. And so 3 halves NKT in kilojoules when N is Avogadro's number, that's actually 3 halves RT because Avogadro's number times Boltzmann's constant is the universal gas constant. So in kilojoules, R is 3.719. And those constants don't change any for fluorine. There's no difference between the two atoms when it comes to the very first term associated with translation. However, if we look at plugging in this excited state energy to this expression, putting in Avogadro's number and two for degeneracy, and then here's where 14,904 wave numbers goes, plugged in here as well with appropriate units for Boltzmann's constant, we discover that its contribution to the total internal energy is 2.081 times 10 to the minus 26th kilojoules. So about 27 orders of magnitude smaller than 3 halves NKT, so negligible. On the other hand, for the fluorine atom, the contribution is actually 1.376, so that's about a third again as much as is associated with the translational component, the contributions to the internal energy. So you do see that as the states get relatively close to the ground state, now they can contribute something. But this helps to put some numbers on just how unimportant it is in most systems. Let me also look at the heat capacity for the monatomic ideal gas. So if the internal energy is the expression we've been working with up till now, I'll remind you the heat capacity at constant volume is the partial derivative of the internal energy with respect to the temperature. So I'm just going to write that here. I'm going to replace U with this expression up above. So I'll do partial, partial T of this thing. And this first term, that's a partial derivative anybody can love. So uh, 3 halves NKT, you take the derivative with respect to T, you get 3 halves NK. That's pretty straightforward. The next partial derivative is a little bit less friendly, but not too bad. We get N degeneracy, excited state energy squared, KT squared in the denominator, the exponential continues to appear, and we could continue with additional terms if we wanted to. So I, I want to come back to our example systems of lithium and fluorine again and just ask what's the contribution here. And we're continuing to use Avogadro's number of atoms. We'll still work at room temperature. And the heat capacity is going to be expressed in joules per Kelvin. Okay, and remember what heat capacity tells you is how much energy does it take to raise the temperature of the system by one degree Kelvin? Okay, so let, let's see what it says. Well, again, the 3 halves NK term, and given that it's uh, Avogadro's number for N, that means 3 halves R, 3 halves times the universal gas constant, 12.47 joules per Kelvin is the heat capacity of lithium gas, atomic lithium gas. It's not a gas you'd really want to play with, actually, but works out well on this slide. And that's just a set of constants. It's exactly the same for fluorine. Now, when we look at the second term, what's the contribution to the total heat capacity at constant volume? Well, it's the additional contribution is 5.02 times 10 to the minus 27th joules per Kelvin in the case of lithium. So again, that is absolutely negligible. That says it doesn't take any measurable amount of energy, 
put into the electronic part of the system in order to raise the temperature a degree Kelvin. Right? But it takes 12.47 joules pumped into translational modes in order to raise it that much. On the other hand, when we put all the appropriate numbers for fluorine, this degeneracy and this excited state energy, into this term, we discover that it contributes an additional, let's call that nine, it's pretty close, nine joules per Kelvin into the constant volume heat capacity. And so the way you should think about that is heat capacity tells you how much energy does it take to raise the temperature a degree. Well, what is temperature? Temperature is a measure of how fast are the molecules moving. Right? When you feel a hot substance, it feels hot because those molecules are hitting you hard. They're moving very, very quickly. So if all the energy you put into a system is going into the translation, then it will heat up as efficiently as, as is given here with this value of 12.47 joules per Kelvin. But if some of the energy is going not to put the molecules into higher energy translational states, but instead to put them into higher energy accessible electronic states, well, that doesn't feel like temperature. That's just putting the energy somewhere else. So you'll need extra energy to raise the temperature enough to feel like the temperature has gone up. And so a fluorine gas would take about 21 joules per Kelvin. A lithium gas, only 12 and a half. It takes more energy to make the fluorine gas as hot as the lithium gas because some of that energy is going into exciting the electronic states instead of exciting the translational states. All right, what about pressure? So we can play the same game and do some partial differentiation. It's a different partial derivative now. So pressure is kT, partial derivative log q with respect to volume, holding number of particles and temperature constant. But of course, we play the same game. We replace the ensemble partition function by the atomic partition function, and we move this exponent n out front. We replace the atomic partition function by the product of the translational and electronic partition functions, and we get this. Again, I'll plug in the actual explicit forms of the partition functions, and I'll just call to your attention, we're taking the partial derivative with respect to the volume, and volume only appears in one place, right here. So I'll end up with, this is a product of a whole bunch of things, so when I take the log, it'll separate it out as log v. And the partial derivative with respect to v of log v is 1 over v. So it all gets pretty easy. I get nkt all over v. And as we looked at last week, actually, that is a recapitulation of the ideal gas equation of state, or the ideal gas law. Namely, that P is equal to nKT over V, or if I express it in molar units, PV equals nRT, chemistry's most famous equation, at least from a thermodynamic standpoint. So let's just summarize what we have uh, derived thus far. So we've got an ensemble partition function for our monatomic ideal gas. The components of the atomic partition function are translational, and electronic, as shown here. From that partition function, we can derive energy, heat capacity, and pressure. And in particular, the energy to a good approximation, in those instances where we don't have excited electronic states contributing, is 3 halves nkt. The heat capacity is 3 halves nk. And the pressure is nkt over v. If we actually work in molar units, which are often more convenient when thinking about real macroscopic quantities, molar units just implies that we're going to use Avogadro's number for n. And in that case, the molar indicated by the bar over the top of the thermodynamic quantity, molar internal energy, 3 halves RT. Molar constant volume heat capacity, 3 halves R. And here's the ideal gas equation of state written in a somewhat unusual way with a bar over the P instead of over the V. I think we'll just leave that as a blooper for this particular Coursera course. But you know that the bar should go over the V, not the P. And that is pressure is equal to RT divided by the molar volume. 
All right, well, let's uh, leave the blooper behind and get back on our uh, powerful train of thermodynamics. And we will continue driving down the tracks. And we're going to start uh, next time looking at not mono monoatomic ideal gases, but let's actually do a diatomic ideal gas. That'll take us more than one lecture to get through because more interesting things start to happen, but we will take our first cut at it.